or as it is found in some manuscripts, the mission of the 72. The translators of the NRSB determined that the number 70 likely was the more reliable and the original number. I agree with this determination for reasons we will talk about in just a few moments. The story we're looking at today follows behind the story of the sending out of the 12 disciples in chapter 9 and the feeding of the 5,000. It directly follows where we are told in Luke chapter 9 that Jesus has made his final turn towards Jerusalem. Time is running short now. Jesus sends these 70 out ahead of him to prepare the way in the towns he has yet to visit or perhaps to revisit. One can question whether he is sending the 70 out because he doesn't believe he has time to visit all the locations he had intended, but to me in the Greek, the idea that these are, the, the idea that these are advanced parties seems to be fairly obvious. Jesus' ministry isn't just a haphazard trip through what we call today the Holy Land. He has a plan, and he is sending people ahead of him to make arrangements for the success of his ministry. If we truly wish to follow his ministry model, then we too need to plan according to God's will and accept the call when given to go ahead to prepare the way. Let's now turn to the text and hear what the author of Luke and Acts is relaying to us. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 20. The mission of the seventy. After this, the Lord appointed seventy others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house, and if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide for the labor it serves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever, whenever you enter a town and as people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town, and they do not welcome you, go out into its street and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, on that day it will be more tolerable for Sodom than, that, than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ash. But at the judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre, Tyre and Sidon than for you. And for you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you Caper Capernaum, excuse me. Will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. As I said earlier, these verses follow after the sending of the twelve, which is generally interpreted to symbolize the witness to the twelve tribes of Judaism. This thus understood as a ministry to the Jewish nation. Here now we have a new, larger group being sent out, 70 or 72 in some manuscripts. The number 70 has a number of meanings for us in reading, when in reading scripture. It is the number of elders that Moses is told to appoint in the 11th chapter of the book of Numbers. It then was used because of this appointment as the number of members of the Sanhedrin. Seventy was also, and what I think is being applied here, the number of nations in the entire world as set out in Genesis chapter 10. This line of thinking is strengthened by the fact that approximately equal numbers of manuscripts state the number of disciples sent out as 70, as they as do 72. The reason for this is that in the Septuagint, 
Genesis chapter 10 records 72 as the number of nations, as opposed to 70 in the Hebrew Old Testament. Thus, here we can be fairly certain that we are encountering a symbolic number for it to represent the number of nations in the entire world. Thus, we are being told, symbolically, that the message of Christ Jesus is to be taken to all the world. None are to be excluded any longer. These disciples are sent out in teams of two, likely due to Jewish law pertaining to a reliable witness requiring two individuals, and due to the great dangers of traveling in biblical times. This model of working in tandem is continued on for the most part into the writings of the book of Acts and the letters of Paul. Jesus sends these 70s out, 70 out with the warning that this will not be an easy trip. They will encounter resistance and confrontations. Certainly, as I mentioned, travel in biblical times was dangerous. There were difficult roads and thugs could be lying in wait to rob lone travelers. But sheep among wolves also most certainly means there is a very real chance they'll be attacked for their witness. We too are often attacked for our witness, though here in the USA it is generally not a physical attack, but certainly the verbal abuse is all too common. Though we have recently seen an increase of actual physical attacks, especially it seems to those Christians protesting at abortion clinics and advocating a pro-life agenda. Still, we are not suffering ever-present danger like some believers are in other regions of the world. Never forget to pray for those whose witness places them in literal danger of physical attack, destruction of property, rape, or even death. Here in Luke's Gospel, time is now short. The metaphor is of the harvest, and we with agricultural backgrounds understand all too well the urgency that harvest brings. There is no dilly-dallying to be done. Jesus sends these 70 out almost like light infantry troops. They're scouting or advanced parties. They are to travel quickly, not burdened by unnecessary possessions. They are not to chit-chat along the way. They are being sent to a predetermined village or town, and, what, and that is where they are to gather intel and make preparations. They're not to try and find the best hosts for themselves, moving from home to home, seeing who will provide them with the greatest luxury. No, they have a job to do, and they want to stay focused on that job. Their job is like ours today, to prepare the way for Christ. There is also talk about eating what is set before them, and this combined with the staying where they are put can be looked upon as a message to those later disciples traveling and spreading the word and works of Christ. Remember all the issues we've talked about in Galatians with the commingling of Gentiles and Hebrews. This eating what is put before you can certainly be applied to a Hebrew Christian staying with a Gentile family or individual. You are to eat and abide by the host, and not search out a family or host whose dietary practices are your own. The Lord has provided a host for you, and you must practice proper hospitality as a guest. Besides, you're about the Lord's work, and things are urgent. It seems that once they've returned to report back to Jesus, that at least some of the locations visited weren't particularly welcoming. We can only wonder if that means that Christ then skipped going to those villages and towns, or if this simply gave him the knowledge of how to present his message once he got there. We have to remember that Scripture is not exhaustive about every stop that Christ made, nor, for that matter, even every stop that Paul made. We can read the verses about shaking dust from the feet and all the woes as telling us that Jesus just gave up on those cities. We could then go on and determine that this allows us to just give up on some people or even places on earth. But that seems to run counter to the parable of the sower. In the story of the sower, he cast seed on all the types of soil. Soil that seems obviously good, and soil that seems hopeless. He does not judge who may or may not be worthy. I don't think these verses here in Luke are telling us to give up on people. It is, to me at least, more intended as a warning to those who may be inclined to reject Christ. There is a certain allowance for grace strangely hidden in these verses of woe. For Jesus says those great sinners in Tyre and Sodom, and even the much maligned Sodom will have it better at the time of judgment than Bethsaida and Capernaum. Jesus lived in Capernaum. 
and it's believed that the disciples lived in Bethsaida after Jesus' ascension. Certainly there was a church in Bethsaida very, very, very early on, and its actual remains have been discovered. If things are going to be better for these three long disparaged cities than they will be for cities that were blessed with Christ actually living there and or the disciples living and ministering there, then can we not see that there is some hope for grace for the most lost and defiant of non-believers today? We are called to cast our seed like the sword of the parable on all soil, rocky, thorny, salty, and what have you. We are not to judge. The only judge is Christ. We are the workers preparing the way of the Lord. We are being sent to work among the thorns and the rocks, even throwing seed where we think it's an absolute waste of time. I have often held forth that it's not for us to know what seed sprouts and what seed flourishes. We are called to assist God with the planting, to water, to nurture, to guide, but the harvest is God's alone. Luke uses the metaphor of harvest, but surely the real harvest is by God's hand alone. Only our egos make us want to count the noses of those whom we've saved. But I can tell you all exactly how many you've all saved. Zero. They've all been saved by God. You can, and we all should, submit to being God's hands and feet, but you need to leave your ego out of it. This need to leave behind, or at the very least keep our egos in storage, is the warning that Jesus gave to the seventy and to us by extension in these verses. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from the heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this. Let the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Lest one is tempted to take these verses literally, I will caution you as one who grew up in rattlesnake country, stepping on certain snakes is never, ever a good idea. But this warning isn't to be taken literally. It's a metaphor for and a warning against human ego. The 70 have just used the wrong word. Us. Sure, they said the demons submitted in the Lord's name, but then they went on and said the demons submitted to us us. Just as you've never saved anyone, no evil will ever submit to your personal power. Jesus is not a magic potion that you wield like some sort of sorcery. This ring, right here, that Gail gave me for Father's Day is a Saint Benedict medal, or also sometimes called a devil chasing medal. It's what my son Creed also calls Catholic witchcraft. It contains verses meant as a talisman against evil. The incantation on it in Latin is supposed to ward off evil, illness, and neutralize poison. Now, when Gail purchased it, she didn't know what it was, and I don't wear it because I believe it has any power or abilities whatsoever. No power, that is, beyond the reminder to the wearer that only through Christ is there any ability to withstand the evil that lurks within the heart of all mankind. The ring's power is simply its ability to remind one to have faith in Christ and in Christ alone. There is no more magic in this ring than there is inside of me the ability to bring any one soul to Christ. Both the ring and I are only reminders of the power, love, grace, and glory of God the Father. Each of you, too, are reminders to the world of the power, love, grace, and glory of your Lord and Savior. Remember that when you go out into the world. But back to our verses. You see, the story of Satan that Jesus is referencing had to do with Satan's pride. He elevated himself to be equal with God, and thus his pride, his ego, poisoned him. And he believed himself the more powerful, or at least as powerful, as God. Remember that the story of Satan is that he was the most beautiful and favored of the angels. Here, in relaying the story of Satan falling from grace, Jesus is not trying to paint a picture of the end times, but rather warning the disciples and all of us to keep our egos in check. It's not about us. It was never about us. It's all about God and doing God's work of bringing his children into a loving relationship with God. 
Paul warns us about ego and doing the Lord's work in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> what I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. I, still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so no one can say that they were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephan, as beyond that I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Let me interject that I love these verses written by Paul, for it shows his humanity in not being able to remember who or even how many he baptized. He's so very human here, someone we can relate to, and I love that part. But I digress. Paul is warning those in Corinth and us to remember that it is Christ that we follow and serve. It's not about our wisdom or our eloquence. It's not about a slick package or a powerful sermon delivery. It's about the grace, the forgiveness, the love of Christ. When we start thinking it has anything to do with us, then we're in danger of failing or falling just as Satan fell. And maybe even worse, we're trying to empty the cross of Christ of his power. Not that I think that we could ever accomplish such a thing. But my friends, we are told to rejoice. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Through our faith in Christ Jesus, we have received the grace of God. And even though we are lowly sinners, our names have been engraved in the book of life. They have been written in heaven. Let us pray. Dear Father, Abba, Creator, Lord, we thank you that through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ Jesus, that we have been welcomed into your blessed kingdom. We, through, through our, human, our evil human nature, are not worthy of being in your presence, have been renewed, redeemed, renewed, restored, recreated into the very children of God. Thank you for that blessing beyond all blessings. As we who are gathered here go forth into your creation here on earth, O oh Lord, use us as your hands and feet to reach those who are lost and hurting. Through your name, your love, your grace alone, let the children all come to you and abide with you forever. Praise be to God and God alone.